Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, DSCC Insight series, which is the monthly webinar appointment organized by the Data Spaces Support Center. This month, we are very happy to introduce to you two key elements of the wide spectrum of guidance, of guidance which is provided by the DSCC, which is the design principle and the blueprint version 1.5. We will do so uh, with our esteemed speaker. And we will have an introduction by Professor Boris Otter, the DSSC project coordinator from Fraunhofer ISST. Then we will, our, uh, our, co our colleagues from TNO, Matthias Punter and Karl Claire Stolweg, will introduce the Blueprint version 1.5. And subsequently, we will have Rafael Hack, which is a research fellow from National University of Ireland Galway, who will introduce to us the data space design principle. We will wrap it up at the end with the QA session. Just a reminder, you can ask questions in the chat throughout the webinar. We will do our best to answer to them. Any unanswered question we will delve for at the very end in the dedicated Q&A. So stick around for the discussion at the end. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. The first one is the SIP webinar is recorded. You can watch this webinar recording and the previous webinar recording on our YouTube channel. And to access our YouTube channel, you can scan the QR code, which you can see here in the slides. On our YouTube channel, you will be also able to see the recordings of our uh, Data Space Symposium, which is our annual event. So please don't hesitate to, to visit it. And last but not least, to stay up to date with everything that we do, uh, for the, you can sign up to the DSSC newsletter. You can click the link on this slide, or you can scan the QR code here. So without further ado, I will leave the floor to Boris, which I think he has no slides. So I will stop sharing uh, so we can start the webinar. Let me see. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. That sounds a little bit like, oh, well, this time <laughs> Boris has no slides. What's 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 wrong here? No, 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 no. Um, because um, I just want also not to, to take too much time, but just um, uh, share with you, let's say that I'm um, really, really glad and, and, and very happy um, that we in this um, webinar can introduce to you um, the next version of the blueprint plus also the design principles. And um, as I said, I don't I don't want to take too much time because Claire and Matthias will outline that in greater detail when it comes to the blueprint. But I would like also to, to stress once more why it's so important and why let's say the blueprint is such a central um, piece of work, not only in the data spaces support center, but in the community who is concerned with implementing the European data strategy in general. Because um, as you know, in our radar, we have, let's say, more or less 160, 170 uh, different initiatives, which all together, well, pave the way towards a fair data um, uh, economy in Europe, implementing data sharing use cases, but um, most notably, of course, common European data spaces. And I think it's it's good every once in a while to reflect well how this process actually works, because it's we are forming an ecosystem, not only the DSSC let's say and its associated partners and let's say the individual um, data space communities, but everybody who is concerned with contributing to the implementation of the common European data space is part of this ecosystem, and this ecosystem consists of well, a, a variety of, let's say, different initiatives and activities in different, let's say, stages of maturity. And therefore, um, it all um, comes together, if you may, in the blueprint and in the building blocks that we in the DSSC well catalyze, I would say. So it's not the case, uh, as you know, that basically there is a couple of guys who sit together every once in a while and then basically write down what just comes to, to their minds. No. Um, this process that we are doing is 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 really an an asset in itself because it's you know um, well a, a culmination accumulation of of the knowledge that is created uh, in this entire um, data, common European data space community and and that's um, that's is really a great thing I should say um, so it is um, a collective effort in the best sense to make um, the fair um, European data economy happen and. As I said earlier, not to anticipate too much, but the current version is called um, 1.5. Um, and that is basically characterized by, of course, new things, updated things. But uh, in my personal opinion, 
um, the biggest, let's say, uh, step forward and the biggest progress that was made compared to the last version, the version one, one is, is really that it's, um, in my point of view, um, um, way more usable and digestible um, um, in its form and presentation. And I think this is really a good thing. Um, once more, and I think Matthias and Claire will point that out, of course, in greater detail, um, this all allows us to, well, to leverage the knowledge that's been created all over the place in, as I said, our community and our ecosystem, make that um, knowledge, let's say, available in a, general, in a generalized form for everybody to take it up. And that basically, of course, brings us to, well, as we sometimes refer to it, higher flight levels faster. So it's really something that accelerates the implementation of the um, of the um, common European data spaces, and that also then is something that is also uh, reflecting reflected in the so-called co-creation method, um, because ecosystem does not necessarily uh, hold true on let's say this this broader viewpoint. Um, we all together as we um, move towards common European data spaces, but of course, let's say also on the level of individual data space initiatives. And it's critical, we all know that, if we don't speak the, the same language in terms of blueprint and building blocks, this will would hinder, let's say, the success, maybe even prevent success from happening. And of course, it would slow down activities. And therefore, uh, this is uh, that's why it's so important to continuously work on the content, content piece of the blueprint and building blocks, but also, let's say, on the usability side, because in the end, it's a tool that should help you guys, um, well, to do your job better and faster. So therefore, um, as I said, I'm, I'm very keen that we are, well, now ha having the chance to also present it to you. Um, and without uh, further ado, I would like then to also first hand back the word to, uh, to Anna so that we can jump in into, let's say, the juicy part of, of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so indeed, let's jump back to the to the juicy part of the webinar. Uh, Matthias, uh, the floor is yours. Right. <laughs> well, the juicy part is a nice uh, way to phrase it. Yeah, so the blueprint for data space is version 1.540, uh, the third version that uh, we are releasing as a, as a DSSC. Um, just see if it works, yes. And I think, uh, Boris, you already mentioned it. Uh, it is about uh, all those data space initiatives that are out there, but also new ones that are starting uh, now um, to really help them to take off and to get to a higher flight level much more quickly. So certain things uh, were already identified. Uh, there are already a lot of best practices uh, out there, also cross domain. And we try to uh, put that into a blueprint for every data space uh, to use. And feedback that we're getting is that uh, it, it's also important to uh, future-proof the investments. It's costly to set up uh, data spaces. You need to uh, get a lot of people together, invest in the right uh, technology. Um, you really want to make sure that it is uh, future-proof. Um, and finally, and that's something we're learning increasingly, uh, it's also about uh, achieving synergies between data spaces. Um, data space initiatives that want to work together but also individual participants of data spaces that need to work in different segments. Maybe I'm both in manufacturing and in logistics because my goods that I'm manufacturing, they need to be shipped uh, to. Um, so I need to be part of, of multiple data spaces. And with the blueprint, we try to address those kinds of uh, questions. Um, now the blueprint, uh, I mentioned it already, uh, today we're launching the third version of it, version 1.5. So we didn't start from scratch. Before the Data Spaces Support Center, there was already the OpenDI project. They, for the first time, introduced uh, the concept of uh, building blocks. Um, we tried to curate a collection of all those best practices in our starter kit. Launched an initial version of uh, the Blueprint, version 0.5, last year. Beginning of this year, we had version 1.0. And today, uh, we are launching version 1.5 of uh, the, the Blueprint. So it's really an evolution of, uh, of, of things. Um, 
And this is not because, well, we in our study rooms uh, are just thinking about new things. Um, we are actually collecting a lot of material from all of those common European data spaces. So the DSSC has a wide community of practice. We have the strategic stakeholder forum. A lot of experts uh, are participating in uh, the data space support center. And we try to learn from them and bring together all those developments into our blueprint. Uh, so what we're presenting you today is also, let's say, new insights that are coming from this uh, community that we try to bundle, we try to funnel, and that we try to bring uh, together for the um, uh, for, for the data space world as a whole. Um, and particularly for this uh, version, we tried also to make it um, yeah, a bit more, you could say prescriptive, but well, uh, maybe in a bit more positive way, provide a bit more guidance. Uh, so we try to be a bit more specific in terms of what are the kinds of standards or best practices or options you should uh, choose uh, between them. We know that in many domains, uh, uh, well, sometimes there are incentives uh, to use it. Sometimes it's even enforced to say, well, you shall use uh, these uh, common uh, specifications. Um, and that's why we believe it's important that we can also provide the necessary guidance. And we try to take a further step in this new version of the blueprint. If you look at the contents of the blueprint, it was already mentioned, it consists of building blocks. And building blocks, they come in two different uh, categories. We have business and organizational building blocks, uh, which focus on, as the name says, the business and organizational capabilities that you need as a data space. And then we have technical building blocks, which focus on the uh, technical capabilities that are needed in data spaces. Um, and for each of them, we identify well, first of all, what is it about? Why do you need it? What are those capabilities that uh, we think every data space should require? We provide specifications and standards or best practices because well, not for everything there is a single standard for, uh, especially on the technical side, we see uh, a huge process towards technology convergence, um, but especially on the business organizational side, of course, you do need to make certain uh, design uh, choices. And finally, we provide references to related material uh, that you can use. Um, in addition to those building blocks, we have a co-creation method. And we'll talk about that in a moment, which sort of guides you through those building blocks. Because for each domain, you need to make domain-specific choices. As you will see, we believe that every data space should have some sort of rule book. Uh, with those choices in them. Um, and so we try to guide you through the blueprint uh, with certain questions. Uh, and then the end result is that you have a set of specifications for your data space. Now, one of the things that we have added in this uh, new version is uh, a more comprehensive introduction. Uh, one of the feedbacks that we were giving is like, okay, but data space is such a wide topic. How does it now all fit together? Uh, and we built on the results that we had in version 1.0, the glossary, and we now try to bring that a bit more together. So what we said is, well, a data space is actually a collection of participants. It's not a single entity. It's uh, data providers, it's data users, it's uh, governance authority. Uh, but in, in its bare essence, it's a group of providers that have some data and users that want some data. It is a role. So maybe sometimes you're a user and sometimes you're a provider. But that collaboration needs to be facilitated by a data space. They exchange a data product uh, for which you need to identify characteristics. Uh, in terms of the legal side, uh, Article 33 of the Data Act, you need to provide metadata on, uh, on the data that you're sharing and license information. And ultimately, if you succeed, there is a data transaction between the provider and the user. And although this is a rather bilateral thing, um, there's also, as I said, the role for a governance authority, uh, because there is a framework, a governance framework, uh, where these transactions take place. Uh, and the output of many of those governance frameworks is a rule book, which specifies a lot of things that all the participants of the data space need to adhere to. It could be a common domain model. It could be some technical specifications, but also a shared business model or a financial scheme. It's all part of the, of the rule book and the governance authority is managing it. And essentially you could say, what is a data space? Well, it's actually a group of participants which adheres to such a rule book. 
Um, it's, it's a definition that we have now put in the, in the, in the blueprint, and, and we really feel it works on many different both business and uh, technical uh, domains. So we are extending on that idea. Actually, there's more, um, because this is all rather conceptual. At the end of the day, um, we also need technology. We need services to implement all of this. So there's a role for service providers. They're participant too in uh, the data space. Maybe they're an intermediary or they're just providing some technical services. So what we added uh, in uh, the new version of the blueprint is actually a taxonomy of services which we feel are necessary for a data space. Services for individuals to join the data space, we call them participant agent services. Uh, services that facilitate the interplay of all the participants, like the catalog, uh, identity provider, we call that group of services, federation services. And finally, uh, all kinds of things that you can do on top of your data space. So we call them value creation services. Think of new AI models, visibility services, and so on. Now I can say much more about this, uh, but please have a look at this new section uh, of uh, the blueprint. We believe it provides a very nice introduction uh, connecting all of the individual bits of the blueprint uh, and bringing them together. Oh, by the way, I almost forget, we also updated the glossary accordingly. So uh, many terms still remain the same, but there were some developments in standardization, legislation, and we updated it. Uh, now, having said all of that, uh, I'd like to give the floor to you, Claire, to talk about the business and organizational building. Thank you. I will do that. I will guide you through the three pillars of our green building blocks. And first of all, I would like to tell you that um, we also changed uh, the names of these three business building blocks um, related to the updates we provided uh, within them. Um, first of all, uh, the business model, what do we have in there? Well, we provide guidelines on uh, value creation and join, joint uh, interest of the participants uh, within the data space. Um, and what's really uh, important to mention here is that we also focus on the multi-sided and the collaborative part of the business model. And that means that you have business models on various levels, on the data space level and for the participants. And it is important that those are uh, aligned. Uh, and it's a responsibility of the governance authority to make that happen. Um, and to be able to align uh, those value propositions and to align these business models, we also provide a canvas uh, specifically for data spaces to support in that. Uh, another building block that we have in place on the green side, on the green business side, um, is use case development, where we provide guidance to identify, refine, and implement uh, use cases uh, that indicate specific settings for value creation. Um, and they start uh, with scenarios, with options for uh, potential use cases in which uh, the data space then can further continue. Um, and the figure you see now, it's a bit difficult to read um, uh, with these uh, blue circles, but you can read it in more detail in the blueprint, uh, provide practical steps uh, to come to such a use case. Then we have uh, the data product in. Uh, the data product definition within the community is still evolving, uh, but for now we use the following uh, working definition. Uh, that's uh, basically saying data sharing units building resources um, and metadata that describe the resources, the associated license terms and other information, like for instance, the delivery method. Um, what can you think of, for instance, when thinking about a data product? Well, this can, for instance, be data uh, for the transport sector and uh, about traffic events and uh, roadworks. Uh, we also have the intermediaries and uh, operators uh, building block. Um, uh, intermediaries uh, uh, are in that sense um, uh, stakeholders, participants that bring parties uh, together. Uh, we make a distinction in different types of intermediaries here uh, related to the services they provide. Uh, and for instance, one of these types focus specifically on personal data. It's important to mention here that uh, the Digital Governance Act sets mandatory requirements for data intermediation services. 
um, which is uh, a part of some uh, intermediaries and some services they provide. And you can, for instance, think of uh, a marketplace to give an example. The governance building blocks. Uh, for the governance building blocks, we, for instance, have in place the organizational form and governance authority, uh, where we make within the building block a distinction between unincorporated and incorporated data spaces. You can see them as temporary or non-temporary data spaces. And what that, does that mean? Well, actually, if you are in the beginning of setting up a data space, it might be the case uh, that you're not sure yet uh, about the sustainability. Um, and then uh, it might be a solution to, for instance, say, we, well, we first start with a consortium agreement or we first uh, make it an alliance or a joint venture to avoid that you already need to set up a whole legal person. Um, and we provide within the building blocks guidelines on uh, yeah, how you can do that practically in the beginning and what's needed when uh, it does become uh, a legal form. Uh, we provide a decision tree for that to support in it. We provide information on uh, how the governance authority can be set up. That's consisting of uh, members uh, responsible for the decision making and for the maintenance of the governance framework. And you can see the governance framework actually as the operationalization of the rulebook. The rulebook was already uh, mentioned before. Um, here you see a, a figure that we also provide in there about uh, the governance authority with practical guidelines on um, how uh, the, the different um, uh, stakeholders uh, can be appointed in that uh, from an assembly uh, to come to an executive body and how the accountability is organized. We also provide uh, guidelines within the building block on uh, participation management, on how to onboard and offboard participants, um, and also provide uh, uh, um, links uh, on their roles and their responsibilities. Then I would like to move to the legal building blocks, where we have in regulatory uh, compliance. It is really to support the data spaces on uh, how to become legally compliant, uh, based on sector agnostic legislation, but also on legislation that's dependent on the type of participant, the type of data, uh, but also the type of sector which is related to the use case. In the figure with the colors, you see um, a structure for the sector agnostic legislation, which is further described in the building block. Um, and we also have the building block on the contractual framework. Um, where we provide uh, further content on uh, data space agreement and data transaction agreements. The data space agreements uh, focus on the participants and how to organize and uh, really structure it legally. Uh, and the data uh, transaction agreements really focus on how the transactions uh, around the data are organized. Um, I would like to give the word yeah. back to Matthijs to further guide us through the technical yeah. building. Will do, and I also see a lively chat uh, happening, and I think some of the things are already addressed there, but please keep uh, sending messages and we'll try to uh, uh, cover them uh, as we go along. Um, so on the technical side, um, uh, the categorization of building blocks is still the same. So you have data interoperability, data sovereignty and trust, and uh, data value creation enablers. To briefly scroll through them, the data interoperability side, it's really about creating semantic models for your data space. They are domain specific, but we do recommend the use of a vocabulary hub or a vocabulary service to actually check, share those models in your uh, community. And that was added in this uh, version. Uh, the data exchange is about APIs and the technical protocols for data exchange. Also, those are likely to be domain specific because every domain will have its own technical protocols through which they actually share data. Nevertheless, we do provide recommendations on how to set them up, how to manage them, and also how to link them to semantics. So the data is inter interoperable in uh, uh, not only in a technical way, but also in the semantic uh, we extended the building block on uh, provenance and traceability. So it's really about, let's say, the auditability. Can you keep track of the transactions that uh, have taken place? 
Um, and in the new version of the building block, we, we provide some options uh, for implementing this, uh, uh, this capability. Uh, there's no common standard for this uh, yet. We do see different approaches. Um, and in the building block, we provide uh, those, uh, those options. Uh, for instance, you could do it uh, through a third party, or you could do it by each participant in, in the data space. And then there are several ways in, in between. So that's on data interoperability. Um, the middle block, data sovereignty and trust, is, of course, a very crucial one. This really uh, makes a data space different from, let's say, your typical EDI data exchange uh, scenario, uh, because you want to be able to identify the partners and the digital assets that you exchange. Uh, if you have the legal building block on the onboarding and offboarding of participants, well, somebody then needs to maintain a participant's register. Uh, and, and the participants need to be identified. So in this building block, we, we talk about the identification, but also other attestations uh, that can relate to this. For instance, somebody complies with a certain policy or somebody uh, is using a certain security standard. Uh, and that can provide, again, a bit of sovereignty, but especially also trust in uh, the data space. Uh, we encourage everyone to use some upcoming standards from the field of self-sovereign identity, like the W3C verifiable credentials standard to implement these capabilities. Um, then, of course, you need a trust framework. So there it's about things like uh, trust anchors uh, that can issue and verify those identities and attestations that I just uh, talked about. Um, and here, too, we see a process of technology convergence happening. So we are including, for instance, certain best practices coming from initiatives like Gaia-X, who have also started not only to develop the protocols for themselves, but also starting projects to independently of uh, the association, provide the protocols as a technical stack you can use for any kind of, uh, of application. And then finally, uh, uh, access and usage policies and their enforcement. This is something that every organization, every participant needs to do. Uh, it's actually part of the, of the data act. Huh? You should provide the license terms under which somebody can use your data. And we provide some technical protocols how you can do it. For instance, the use of the open digital rights language for expressing those policies. And the recently uh, announced data space protocol that you can use to then negotiate those contracts. So somebody might uh, supply you with such a policy, and then, of course, the user of that data needs to agree to that policy, uh, which should then result in the data transaction and the actual contract between the provider of the data and the user of the data. This building block focuses on the necessary technical protocols for doing that. And finally, in the third pillar, it's about data value creations. Uh, and to enable that, first of all, it is about providing the data products in your data space and providing the metadata using DCAT, for instance, as an open standard to do it. Once you have uh, described that, you also want to publish it and make it available to, uh, to others. So there's uh, the building block of uh, publication and discovery. And this is where the data space protocol comes back again. Again, using the DCAT standard to uh, uh, publish that offering, making the link uh, to a transaction that can take place, making the link again then to the policy negotiation that needs to happen, and finally, of course, the data exchange, uh, that is the result uh, of it. Finally, and I already mentioned it in my introduction, we're talking about value creation services, so services which function on top of your data space um, uh, to provide additional uh, shared uh, uh, value-added services. So that's an overview of the technical building blocks. Of course, I could spend way more time on individual building blocks, but I encourage you to also read the text uh, that we have available on this. And if there, of course, are specific questions, please ask them in the Q&A, and we can follow up uh, on those. I already mentioned that on the blueprint as a whole, we added a new introduction section. Uh, for the technical part, we also added a few new general sections. So one is, and we call that foundational standards, where we have taken a look at all the building blocks. And then we notice that there are a few open standards that we see in many of them. 
Uh, they were also in my previous slides, like the open digital rights language, uh, the use of verifiable credentials, and so on. Uh, and we've now combined that into one page where we uh, provide a bit more insight into those uh, standards and where we also provide you with links to a number of protocols that explain how you can use them uh, together. Partly that's in the works. Uh, so the data space protocol was launched by the International Data Spaces Association, but further standardization will take place uh, there. And the same is due to happen on the trust uh, side as well. But we provide at least now an introduction in this section. Um, another major element is the difference between what we call a control plane and a data plane. We believe that the data plane is very often very domain specific. It's about your domain specific APIs and uh, well, your domain specific data and algorithms. That's, that's different in every use case and different in every domain. But if you look at the control plane, so the processes for publishing your data, for exchanging uh, uh, and, and doing the contract uh, negotiation, uh, that is quite common. And that's why we call it a control plane. Um, and, well, we, we, try, we thought it's good because this is linking to many different building blocks to bring this together and add a new section on this to explain this if you're not yet familiar with uh, those concepts. And then finally, the services section. Um, and this is a bit special. We already had uh, uh, in the previous version sort of a picture where we were talking about connectors and catalogs and how it all worked together. And we gathered a lot of further insights into this. So thank you for those of you who have uh, contributed uh, to, uh, to this. Um, but we said, actually, if you're a data space initiative, then of course you want to think about everything that is domain specific. But then there are also a number of services that you just want to buy. It should be a purchasing decision to, to do. Uh, that's basically like saying, well, I need an ERP system in my company. And then the only question is, what kind of ERP system am I going to buy? But everybody knows what an ERP system is. So we said, can we maybe in, in that same fashion provide a taxonomy of services that, are, uh, that can be used to implement uh, a data space? we came up with uh, is uh, uh, a taxonomy in three main categories. First of all, participant agent services for individual participants to join a data space. You see it here in the small picture. There, for instance, you want to have like a wallet or another credential store where you can store your identity credentials and your attestations. There you have the common functionality needed for the control plane that I just talked about, being able to publish your data being able to do the contract negotiation. And finally, there's the data plane, which controls the actual exchange of, uh, of data. Secondly, we're talking about the federation services that support the interplay of participants. Um, there, more services can be in place, like the validation and verification of uh, participants for the onboarding and offboarding of participants. Policy information points, for instance, to manage personal consent on a data space uh, level, a catalog of uh, services, observability services, and so on. Um, so this is the second, and I think also a very important uh, category. Um, and then thirdly, services that can act on top of the data space, the value creation services. Uh, and those uh, will be likely very domain specific. So we don't provide a further categorization on, on that. What we hope is that uh, other initiatives will actually start to implement the, those services. And this is actually happening. So later this year, we will curate uh, a number of uh, software components that can help you to implement those services in the DSSC toolbooks. And this, by the way, is also our link to the simple program. Uh, which is, of course, another program within uh, the EU to develop actual software for, for data spaces. So we're collaborating with them on this topic uh, as well. A lot of information, but you need to do something with it. Co-creation. Claire. Exactly. I will uh, tell you a bit more. It was already mentioned by uh, Boris. The co-creation method was also in our previous version in place, but we are further developing it developing it because um, when you have the various building blocks, there are still choices that needs to be made and needs to be made together. It needs to be done in co-creation. 
So you need to align, for instance, on the stakeholders uh, that you incorporate in the data space. You need to develop uh, use cases and functional requirements. You need to establish an organizational form and also the functional analysis um, and uh, the data space design are important to really be able to establish the data space and to come to uh, agreements and policies here. Um, so related to these processes, you see green and blue building blocks based on which decisions needs to be taken to come to a next flight level. Um, and um, while building further in our cur current version, uh, we extended the technical side of the co-creation method. Uh, we added, as mentioned by Matthijs before, uh, co-creation questions uh, for each of the building blocks. Um, and we also developed various uh, flow charts to support in the decision making around the various building blocks. And they focus, for instance, on scope alignment, as I mentioned, on uh, use cases and functional requirements, organizational form, and also participation. But related to that, it's of course uh, also important to make uh, choices on the design principles. And with that, I would like to hand over uh, to Rafik, who will tell you more about the design principles. Let me share my screen. Is it visible? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Claire, for um, for um, for uh, handing over to me. Design principle is very much related to the development work of development of the data spaces. So, to be honest, this is, I guess, like it's the second public appearance of the design principle. But broadly speaking, that's perhaps like many of you have encountered the design principle for the first time from the DSS side. So today I'm going to introduce the design principle. What is it in our sense in, uh, in DSSC? I'll explain that how these design principles became a reality for us, how we constructed them. And we'll introduce the design principle that we have developed so far. So we basically have different types two main types is the pillar specific and across pillar design principles. So I'll introduce them. But frankly speaking, maybe it's not possible because of the time limitation to go detail of each of the design principle. So I will just keep it like at the introductory level, but of course you can go online uh, and read the detail of the design principles. And finally, like uh, a kind of like a scenario that will show that how design principle can be used. To begin with, uh, well, principle, I like this definition, to be honest, like about the principle. A principle may relate to a fundamental truth or a proposition that serves as a foundation for the system of a belief or a behavior or chain of reasoning. In our case, it's something similar, right? But more of like a proposition. This is why we call it like the data space design principle that we are building are more or less like the set of high level guidelines that help you to make an informed design decisions. So that's that's the basically like to to simplify it. This is how we see the design principle uh, design principles are. Now, when we build this design principle, one thing that we had in mind is the design principle should focus on the 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 core value or the essential of the success of the data space is that how the data space could be designed and implemented uh, successfully. Of course, it is not, um, let's say that it is not like came from any literature or something. It came from the professional experts, their opinions and their justifications. And that's basically, let's say, is the, is the, is the fundamental, let's say, that um, essence of that, how we, we, we build this design principles. Now, why do you need to care about the design principle? So that's basically very, let's say, um, uh, I would say that the valid question. Of course, one important thing is that the design choices should be consistent because if we see the, 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 the different building blocks, the scale of the data spaces that we have 
I mean, it's not really a simple thing. It's like complex things, right? So the design principle helps you to make the design decision of a complex things in a very consistent way. And of course, like you don't want to build something and then experience an unexpected behavior. So design principle can contribute there is that it can kind of like help the data space initiative to understand that any unexpected behavior, behavior before it goes to the runtime. And the third point that it is a very important point is that I want to see even in a typical software development lifecycle, if you see, we put a lot of emphasis before implementing a software in the design part is that we want to say that every functional and non-functional requirements in the software have been met. And of course, like design is a kind of like, you know, that is a place that where a lot of emphasis can be put. The principle can help you there to see that the objective that you have, the business objective or whatever objective you have in your data space is met in the design. So the principle can help you in that. Now, uh, regarding the scope, so when we were building the design principle, so what we did that where this design principle fit into the into the uh, blueprint version, uh, blueprint version 1.5 or generically speaking, like the blueprint of the DSSC. So the principle actually, we wanted to have it a high level because you have the building blocks, you have the guidelines in the building block side as well. So we wanted to stay at the high level, at the design level. So this is why we always focus on like the pillar rather than, of course, we cover, for example, like inside the pillar, we cover, of course, like the building blocks, but the design principle more, you know, like stays at the meta level, like the pillar level, we call it like the business design principle, governance design principle, legal like that. So this is why we call it like, you know, like as a meta level. So the design principle can be pillar specific. So the scope of the design principle can be pillar, like one pillar, let's say that it's only for the business, it's only for the governance. But at the same time, there are design principle that goes to the cross pillar. So it's not only one principle cannot be used, may not be used only in the governance, but also in the governance, uh, govern, uh, data sovereignty and trust or data interoperability and business. So we have both types. We wanted to make it sector agnostic. So we didn't want to, let's say that make that sector specific principle, let's say that for health data space, these are, these are the design principle for, let's say for media data space, for language, for scale. We didn't want to go in that line because then, then the design principle list will be very big and it can, it can be very much exhaustive. So we wanted to limit ourselves at the agnostic level. Technology, the design principle doesn't talk about any specific technology. It's basically technology agnostic. Now, one point is that our design principle doesn't advocate anything about the elements of softwares or, you know, like hardware or anything. So that's just, you know, like one note. So I just gave you a very, let's say that lightweight introduction of what is it, why do we need it and what are the scopes? And now, why, how, do, do we, how did we build it? It's actually started a, with the existing design principles. So as you know, Matthias also pointed out like uh, the open day. So open day actually has the core design principle that where we begin. So we started, we didn't want to reinvent anything, right? Reinvent the wheel. So what we wanted to do is that we wanted to see what is there or what is there in open day. And then what is actually evolving requirements of the data spaces since the open day, you know, like completed. So we took this uh, open day design principle and then all the requirements that we have collected, like, you know, from the community of practice and the network of stakeholders. So those requirements we analyzed and we came up with the first version of the design principle. So, yeah, well, I mean, the first version contained a lot of design principles. So it was more or less like the 22 design principles, but then like, you know, we started revisiting each of the design principle with, not by us, with the thematic group and the other type, other, other experts and organizing like a workshop and the checking with the experts using the Delphi study. So in Delphi study, it's a very old study. So Delphi study is a very simple thing. So you put actually 
five, six different experts, and then you cross validate your design principle with the different questions. And then all, when all the experts come to a consensus that, okay, it makes sense, this design principle is really useful or really can be used, or it is a design principle, we say that, okay, we this is kind of like you know an acceptable agreement with them. So, and then we consider it as a design principle. So that's a kind of like a methodology we build and we produce this version 2.0 doing this. Now, when you read it, I mean, you, you may not, you will not see it like this structure here, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to present, but this is uh, uh, practically the structure of each of the design principle that we write. So the publication is, is in progress. So if you see uh, our design principle, you see the structures that one design principle, it has scope and objective. So when it goes to scope and objective, it essentially says that where it lies in which of the pillars. And sometimes for instance, like it actually explicitly say that what are the most potential building blocks this design principle fits in. And then you, then what we have is that we have a very high level guiding rules that, okay, if you have this design principle and if you want to have it in place in your data space, so these are the high level guiding rules and the mechanism that you need to follow. Finally, we have a small part of this design principle is that rules, who are the rules involved? Is it a data provider, data consumers? Who is gonna implement it? Who are the enactors? So this is the structure that you would see when you will read our design principle. Now let's have a look, uh, sorry. Let's have a look, what do we have in our list? So as I was saying, that we categorize them the cross pillar design principle and the pillar specific design principle. This categorization was actually made based on the scope of it. Now, what do we have? We have eight cross pillar design principle, right? Incentivization. I will just read the short name so you can see, for example, the long name here, incentivization. The second one, we call it ADA. That's availability, discoverability, accessibility, Essentially, it's a fair principle, you could say. But since we, you know, like we separated interoperability from this, so we kind of like renamed it. Transparency, establishing trust and security in data space, ensure compliance with the EU legal framework and norms, ensure participant rights in data sovereignty, promote participation through inclusivity, promote environmental sustainability. And then we have this pillar-specific design principle that is reusability of data, ensure data interoperability in data spaces, establish fit for purpose contractual framework, adaptable data space governance framework and pursuit quality by design. So these are basically, let's say that the list of design principle we have. Now, one thing that I'm just, you know, telling you like over the last, let's say that 10, 11 months, what we followed is that all, I mean, like what basically the fundamentally we found that all of our design principle actually cover three main or fundamental principle is the trust, governance and compliance, and then basically let's say interoperability. So they all revolve around them. And that's where the data space is. It's like, if you are considering the object oriented programming, if you, Think about like a software engineering, encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction. That's where we call it, this is object-oriented paradigm. It's the same thing, trust, interoperability, governance makes a data space a data space. So our design principle is something like this, is a revolve around those. I will very quickly go what the contains. So a reusability of data, I'll come with the pillar specific one. As you can see, the scope of this particular design principle is the data value creation. So what's the fundamental element of this? Integrity. So data integrity is very important to make it reusable. So when you're building a data space, make sure that the data integrity is confirmed. Clear comprehensive metadata because you need to make the data reusable, right? Modularity and granularity. So modularity, is a very key element, like when you were thinking that your data should be reusable, right? Because 
a user may not take the whole data, but part of the data, right? So modularity is something that, you know, like can help there. Granularity will always give the details about your data set. Now, what the value that the usability of data is bringing to your data space or the participant and et cetera, I didn't put like, you know, very specific detail to who the value is there, a value will be added, but generally speaking, that when you have this reusability of data, it can span any, you know, like a multiple type of different applications. Extending lifespan, when your data is reusable in your data space, the lifespan of the data space, the lifespan of the data space will be spanned. And definitely the collaboration among the participants, even the cross data space collaboration, if your data is in reusable format and the reusable structure, then it's definitely, you know, like enhance that collaboration. Quality is the key of, for instance, like in, in a modern day data ecosystem. If your data is not quality, so if you cannot ensure that your data space is basically having the quality data set uh, or facilitating the quality data set exchange between the consumer and the provider, you may lose a great reputation efforts. The, the elements that we focused on in the quality, accuracy, consistency, completeness, richness, and reliability. And please note that I mentioned, I, I emphasized on data quality, but in our, in this design principle, we really did not advocate to make the quality only about the data, but about the services that you have in the data space or anything that you are going to, your participant is going to be trading in your data space. So maintain the quality, even the governance is a governance uh, mechanism should have a good quality. Again, this particular uh, design principle will, you know, like will focus on the data value creation. The scope is the data value creation. What it will bring is the trust. If I don't trust that you have a good quality data, I will not, you know, like I will not go to your data space. Interoperability, standardization is a part of the quality that actually facilitated the interoperability. So it's a value. Compliance and risk mitigation. Now compliance is again, you know, compliance became a part of the quality because your data needs to be compliant to the, especially in the EU, you know, like um, the standpoint is that your data needs to be always, if it is a personal data, it needs to be compliant with the GDPR and et cetera. So that is a part of the quality as well. And of course, reputation and attractiveness, I say that if your data is in good quality, you will be reputed, your data space will be reputed. This is a this is a, a kind of like you know this is a principle that we uh, we sort of you know our team actually it's a teamwork to be honest so our team came up with the adaptable data governance framework so it's like the future proofing right so I mean you have the governance framework and the governance framework is a is a very much you know like static but not dynamic enough cannot adapt enough and cannot scale according to the needs then there is a problem, right? So this is where the this design principle will guide you that how to make adaptable, how to how to be scalable. The value of it responsive to the regulatory change. So you need to be you need to be responsive to the regulatory change. You, you need when I say you you means like data space to foster cross sector collaboration because if you have an adaptable governance framework, there is a possibility that you can actually have. Uh, um, you know, like um, uh, can foster the cross-sector collaboration and the trust, again, the trust. Um, fit for purpose contractual framework. Now you have, um, you have, let's say that you have a different participants and different participants can, can have the, you know, like the negotiation power that I want to, let's say that I want to, a data provider and data recipients may negotiate and negotiation is not like, it's not always like a generic negotiation, but a tailored negotiation. So if you want to build, for example, let's say a dynamic sort of data space where you facilitate that, you know, that sort of, you know, contractual framework, that's basically, let's say that um, is good for the data space. And this is where this design principle come and play a significant role. We're calling it the main elements of this is the main concept of this design principle is that tailored legal agreement and non-discriminatory conditions. Non-discriminatory condition is that 
everybody has a fair proposition and negotiate and build a contractual framework that fit their, their needs. And then like the value of it is that enhance the trust because you know, like I trust this data space because I feel that I have the power to negotiate. Increased data sharing and collaboration, fair allocation of rights and obligations. So these are the value, for example, let's say that this design principle can bring in for the data space. Again, this particular design principle is focusing on the legal pillar. Interoperability, uh, to be honest, I mean, there is not much thing to say about it. It's the it's the grounding principle for, for data space, because if it is not interoperable, it's not data space as is. Even the definition says that the data space is the first, it starts with an interoperable framework. The elements of this particular design principle is standardized format, common data model, standardized API, common communication protocol, rich metadata. Essentially, you can argue that there are more. Actually, there are more elements in it. I just you know, listed some of the key. The value, definitely it's the one which will break the silos between the, the thing. So I can share very quick, let's say that experience that you know, health data spaces is something, for example, let's say that there are different sort of, you know, that data formats are there and the different, for example, different organization cannot share the data between them. So there is a silo. So this interoperability will break the silo, consistency it will ensure the consistency across the systems, streamline the operation and cross-sector collaboration. So we have a data interoperability pillars. So that's basically, let's say that this principle focused on that. Now, very quickly, I will go to the cross pillar design principles. Incentivization. If you if you cannot actually like, I mean, it's it's a kind of like um a sort of the 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 motivation for you know like for people to come into your data space. So you need to have an incentive structure and model, a good one. So incentive structure doesn't only mean that financial incentives, it can be non-financial. A reputation is incentive. And also, for example, compliance with the regulation can be an incentive, right? So you need to have an incentive structure and models. And then basically the collaboration, proper collaboration mechanism. You need to, for example, ensure that there is a mutual benefits and shared value creation between the participants. This particular design principle is, is will serve the building blocks of business and the data value creation. Now the value of it, that if you have an incentive, you have a good synergy between the data space participants, then certainly you will increase the participation and your, your, your whole data ecosystem, that means like the data space will be sustainable and finally economic and operational efficiency will be there. Compliance with the EU legal form, again, like, I mean, as I say, the compliance is one of the, one of the foundational things in, the, in, in our view is that I mean, if you are talking about the data and data ecosystem within Europe, within European territories, European Union territories, of course, like the compliance is one of the key things. So the key element of this principle is that European legal regulatory sentence uh, standards, so, sorry, compliance with the sectorial regulations. So there are sectorial regulations, there's a regulation for healthcare, I believe, as far as I know, governance and legal accountability. This particular design principle is scoped for governance, legal, and the data sovereignty and trust. So these are the three, for example, the, 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 the building blocks of three, these three pillars is basically is the scope of this design principle. The value, legal and regulatory assurance, trust and confidence. Again, the trust is, is, is the key piece here and strength and governance and accountability in data space. Availability and discoverability, as I said, like it's a very much, you know, um, I would say that, you know, it's just been, the level is different, but it's a fair principle. So you, you, you make the data available and openness and accessibility. So make sure that the participant has, um, it, it has the accessibility to the data. And of course, like you need the discoverability uh, of the data by the participants. And this design principle is uh, serving the building blocks of the business side of it and the data value creation enabler and interoperability. Now the value of it is that the, the value that it's adding is maximizing the utilization. Of course, when the data is available, discoverable, you will maximize the utilization of your, your data space. 
promote the data democratization because data availability means like you're promoting the democratization of the data, scaling the data space again, like, you know, the border and industries. Now, not the point is that this value also somehow related with the, with the legal side uh, as well. Transparency is, is the, 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 the main elements of the main concept of transparency design principle is the decision-making process has to be transparent. As I was saying that there has to be, for instance, like a, a confidence from the participant side is that, you know, like um, they can see everything that what has been made. It's not like, you know, data governance authority make a decision and then that's done. I mean, it's not like it, it cannot be seen by the other participants. So whatever decision is made, has to be, you know, like very much transparent. The common governance framework is another uh, another important thing and the traceability. So whatever is there, there has to be a kind of like a complete log, right? It's it's about the data transaction, it's about the making decision and et cetera, so that all the participants can trace what is happening and what happened. Now, this particular um, design principle is like, you know, can be used for the building blocks of the governance pillar, interoperability pillar, data sovereignty and trust, and data value creation. Now, the value is that, of course, again, trust, trust, accountability, and governance, and hence the collaboration, and mitigating the risk and conflict between the participants. Establishing trust and security, so I have no words to say, once again, is it's a bit like, you know, this is this is a kind of like, you know, the, the, the elements shows that the, the, uh, uh, the technicality of it, but it's not only the technicality of it, it's like, you know, the trust is all over the data space, all over business, governance, legal, interoperability, sovereignty, and even evaluation, everywhere the trust is there. Anyway, the, the main elements that what we have is the trust and security piece is that identification and claim management. Again, it's a bit of technical side verifiable credentials, security measures and protocols. So um, the two um, the two different, um, the, the building blocks of two different pillars are related to this design principle is the legal and data sovereignty and trust. Of course, again, the value is, it will increase the trust, user empowerment and satisfaction, willingness to share the data. I will share the data as for example, if I'm a personal, I mean, if I'm a person and I want to share the data in a data space, the first thing, of course, like I will see that how much trust in the data space and how much it is secure. Ensure participants' rights in data sovereignty. So it's again, like it's a, again, like as I was saying, I said in the beginning, very beginning, is that many of this our design principle is actually related to the trust and interoperability. So as you can see, even this one, like it's like again, like the trust related, although like you know, it's talking about the sovereignty. So the sovereignty is here. The, the, the main elements are right to access the data and control, informed content, consent mechanism, and data portability. So these are the key elements of the key concepts of this design principle. And the three um, pillars that basically this design principle covers is governance, interoperability, and data sovereignty and trust. And the value of it is like the value related to this design principle is enhanced data sharing, empowerment of participation once again, and enhanced uh, data sharing. Oh, sorry, there is reputation. Sorry about that. Uh, promote participation through inclusivity. It's it's again um, the the key the key idea of this particular design principle is to be fair and given equal opportunity, right? That will basically, let's say that promotes um, the participation of the user. So uh, the, the idea is that in data space, of course, like when you are a data space initiative, the objective here is to involve more and more participants. So this is this design principle is a kind of like, you know, is a, is a um, sort of, you know, guiding the data space initiative is that how to make sure that you, you can, you know, like, promote the participation. So the accessible participation mechanism is one of the main concept of it. And then uh, the inclusive governance mechanism and fairness and equality. So this, um, uh, this, um, uh, this, this design principle is covering two different, um, uh, two different, uh, two different pillars. 
One is the governance and the data value creation. So basically the, the building blocks, if you want to design of these two different, let's say pillars, this design principle can be used. And of course, like um, the core value of it is that you will encourage the data sharing. You will kind of like, you know, um, facilitate the, uh, the, um, uh, the resource optimization and stimulate the long-term engagement because the more you will make it inclusive, your data space will have, you know, like the sustainability or the participants will be, will engage for the long-term. The last but not least is the environmental sustainability. So this design principle is uh, particularly applied to all the building blocks. So um, of, of the building blocks of all the pillars. So the main idea here is to how your data space should be you know, sustainable from the environment standpoint. So sustainable data management practices is one of the key concepts of here. Data lifecycle management and eco-friendly technologies. So basically these are the three uh, main elements uh, of this, uh, you know, like the, of this particular design principle. So of course, like the value is like, you know, we, it's, uh, we, know, uh, we know the value of it, the reduced environmental impact, enhanced reputation and alignment with the global initiative um, data sharing. And uh, well, I mean, currently, like everybody is talking about the about the um, uh, you know the climate condition and like you know the um, uh, zero carbon emission. So of course, uh, the data space being a sort of like a, a complex technology at the technology layer, we kind of like you know um, uh, propose this design principle to make it environmentally sustainable. Uh, the last thing is that the um, uh, design principle in action. So it's a kind of like a very simple scenario that we, I, I wanted to sh show um, uh, to you is that where the design principle basically fits. So um, the, uh, this, the, the simple scenario here is that consider like, you know, a health data space. So participant basically, you know, like um, will decide first uh, is that what are the fundamental characteristics of the data space? So it can be, for example, the trust. So, I mean, people can focus on the trust, on, the, on, on interoperability and the legal framework and et cetera, uh, compliance with the legal EU legal framework and et cetera. And it, it, based on the, the characteristics or the, um, let's say the, 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 the base characteristics or the target characteristics of the data space, the, the data space design and development team can actually, let's say, they start exploring the design principle. So as Matthias and, um, um, and Claire pointed out is that uh, when you are building the, uh, the different processes, when you are following the different process in the co-creation method, the exploratory stage is basically one idea that where the design principle can be explored and see that which of the design principle I can really use for my um, you know, like, uh, or not, not I can use which of the design principle fit for my data space. Uh, so basically, like, you know, that you can explore the design principle there, then you can identify um, the design principle from the list of the palettes or list of, for example, the design principle that we propose, select it, and then basically, let's say that start the development process. So this is one way. But one thing that we always view the design principle is that the design principle is not in any particular, you know, like stage of the um, of the development process. It can come anywhere. So it is basically sort of like, you know, an interacting with the design principle and then come back to your data space, interacting with the design principle, come back to your data space. So it's, it's a continuous consultation with the design principle to develop it. And then perhaps like, you know, continuously update um, your um, legal side, governance side, the business model side, and the, and the trust side, security side, interoperability side. So with that, thank you very much. Um, and I'm handing over to, uh, to, to Anna, please, Anna. Thank you, Rafik. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I also see a very lively chat, so please keep, keep writing. Uh, I because we are going through the Q and A, but first we do have a few um, other call to action that we would like to share with you. So I have 
Gianfranco here with me who decided, and I will share the screen again. And I will hand over soon the floor to Gianfranco so he can help, he can support our call to action and then we can, we can he can help me, he can also lead actually the, uh, the coordination of the Q&A. So now I'll share the proper screen, there you go. So Gianfranco, thank you for joining and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Anna. Uh, we will not be able to finish properly one of these events without asking you to do your part of the work because this is a co-creation exercise we're doing with you and we're not going anywhere unless you help us. I, I see Claire nodding vigorously. That That's exactly what I want. So you must connect with us. You must use what we do. By using, you will get angry and frustrated. Oh, why this is missing? Why this is not as great as I would write it myself? Eh, come and join us and write it yourself. Uh, you can uh, work with us and contribute to our work by using uh, uh, the uh, uh, very parts in uh, our website where we can uh, engage you and, 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 and be with us. Sometimes we joke saying, uh, we either comply with what we're saying or explain why you're not doing it. It's a bit arrogant perhaps, but you got the feeling, right? So uh, there is value in your beliefs and in how you do things uh, when they're different from how we do it or how we suggest we do it. Uh, so please just uh, let us know. Uh, I believe this the website is self-explanatory. There is perhaps the link in the next slide, uh, Anna. I don't remember it by heart. Uh, of course, the, the website, the main website is where you will find most of what we do, if not perhaps the work that is in flight. Uh, the news, oh, sorry. <laughs> and the uh, work specifically, uh, it's so vast at this moment. We are, we are like two years in the project. Most of it is under uh, the SSC offers the icon to the right where you will find the full list of assets that are ready for you to reuse in a, in a nice structure that will allow you to find your feet in it. The support icon in the middle is the one by which you can either uh, ask for specific requests or try uh, or ask to join one of our uh, working groups, the ones that actually write uh, the guidance together with us. Anna, what do you say? Would would this was this sufficient? Oh yeah, of course. It, it was sufficient, but there is a the another another big call to action, which is yeah, absolutely. How, yeah, yeah. So I'll leave you the floor because not forget the our great DSC newsletter. Uh, There's not much to say, right? Like <laughs> and subscribe. Uh, it's the it's the usual uh, invitation. Uh, the best way to follow everything that we are doing is actually to use the newsletter. Uh, just to give you an anticipation of it, in the next one, we will finally be able to open the doors to the toolbox. It's something you must have heard if you followed us so far. Uh, I literally got uh, the the commissions okay to launch this morning, which means that we will open the doors very, very soon. Uh, yay. Uh, it is the first time we can open the doors after having collected your submission to actual implementations of the building blocks available. For example, pieces of software running as a connector. Uh, finally, we start publishing back the results in the catalog of the toolbox. So the list of components that pass the validation process and are ready for you. Uh, again, uh, follow the newsletter or just check back on us, possibly literally tomorrow. I know they are preparing that. Um, and now I would say we go for the Q and A. And what do you say? I collected uh, the, the the not the most interesting one. But not they don't need to be interesting. Sometimes they just uh, beautiful questions. And I have several in front of me. I will start from the one you submitted in the actual Q and A section of Zoom. Uh, the first one was from Anna Pov. Uh, can you please present the common the common European data spaces? Is there a clear number of them? Are they clearly designated? or is it open to interpretation? So uh, I would give you the answer on this one. I know the other guys also can help, but it's relatively easy. There's a section on the uh, website I will point you to that is not necessarily the set of common European data spaces, but it is the set of those data spaces that, that the SSC is required to support. It is a subset of it. Uh, sometimes, the name uh, has been abused over the last uh, couple of years. Um, you will find often projects that are data spaces but are not called that way, or projects that call themselves data spaces but are not. I leave to you to guess what they are. No, I'm joking. So uh, there is some ambiguity around it, uh, and we recognize that. Um, in, in any case, the 
ultimate arbiter of that is actually the commission. Uh, so th there is some, uh, um, the only one who can answer that question is, is, is them. At the same time, uh, I will point you in the chat to where on our website, we actually point to the list of the officially recognized common European data spaces that we are called to support. I believe that's a fair answer. Uh, I don't know, Anna, if you're in uh, the chat, uh, give me a thumbs up or something. No, yes. not Anna. 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 Oh. Not the one with the question. It doesn't, thanks. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Good. Second, anonymous attendee, uh, mystery man or woman. Why hasn't compatibility with the DOM project based on the open standards adopted for publication and contracting of data services, for example, TM formal standards, in such core project of the Digital Europe program being referred in the technical building blocks, at least in this presentation. I would uh, redirect this to Matthias. So what do you know of the DOM project? I, I, I'm sure I've heard it before in our circle. Uh, why isn't DOM referred in the building block? Well, so, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it is actually, if you go into the text of uh, the uh, of, of the various building blocks, it actually links to uh, a number of building blocks. So. For instance, I know that uh, DOME is also using uh, some of the standards like verifiable credentials uh, for the identification and attestation management. Um, so there is a link in that sense. Um, but in general, what DOME is, is a marketplace. And a marketplace in the taxonomy of the DSSC is a value creation service. So it's really something that you could put on top of uh, a data space. And uh, we also, in, in, I think in the 0.5 version, we actually had a building block, which we titled Marketplace. And one of the feedbacks that we were then given is that many data spaces said, well, but we are actually not a marketplace of data. So we use data as a crucial enabler for other functions, and we don't like trade on, uh, on data. Um, so that's why we have now put the Marketplace functionality under uh, the value creation uh, building block. And actually, I think that uh, the DOM project is, is mentioned there as an example uh, of, uh, uh, of such. So hopefully that addresses uh, the, the question. Thank you, Matthijs. Um, let's go to uh, Tjerk. Uh, he wrote a lot today. It's quite good. In, in several cases, I managed to reply uh, on the fly in chat. Um, but there are a few that I believe are possibly of larger interest to the others. So I, I will try to repeat them uh, say out loud. The, the one I chose first is, what is the legal position of authority of a data space governance authority? Uh, for example, how does this work contractually among participants? I'm asking this in the context of a EU co-funded data space that is about to start. Uh, Claire perhaps can help with this. Yes. Um, so can you one more time, because I had a bit an issue with hearing the exact details, repeat the question. No yeah. What is the legal position or authority of a data space governance authority? How does this work contractually among participants? Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, that's, that's also, and I'm not uh, a lawyer, let me begin with that, um, but that, that, of course, also um, uh, depends a bit on uh, uh, how you formulate the, the, the various agreements in the contractual uh, agreement, of course, um, but, um, okay, um, but um, uh, the, the the question is also a bit, and I'm not sure whether uh, Chair can clarify that a little bit more. What he exactly means with this, if if you can elaborate a little bit more, because I'm not fully uh, uh, clear if I fully understand his question in this case. I'm looking it up if I have it here. Um, yeah, Chair is uh, still in the room, so perhaps Chair just. Okay. Yeah, so if you if, if you if you type it in, then uh, then it would work. We should have it here. <laughs> Otherwise, maybe we can do another question in the meantime. Oh, there oh, yeah. is. Yeah. 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 Here, you have it. Uh, what's legal? Yeah. I think this also relates to the decision tree. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and that's what I also um, uh, wanted to say a bit. You, of course, have to uh, then go through the various steps uh, within the decision tree and to see, uh, because it's also, of course, a bit uh, uh, dependent uh, on how you organize it. Eh? For instance, if your uh, data space is still not 
um, uh, sustainable in the sense that you are not sure at that moment whether it will exist for longer term, uh, then you can, for instance, work with first uh, uh, a consortium agreements and start a bit uh, low level. Uh, but if you have, for instance, uh, really a legal person, and uh, if it, for instance, is an association, um, and it's, uh, for instance, also an initiative that's uh, for uh, the public domain, yeah, then you also fell under certain legislation, uh, and then you really need to take that into account and to also make sure that you really uh, adhere to that. Uh, so it also depends really on, uh, in that sense, how you organize it and, and um, yeah, a bit on, on the context. So it's also a bit of a, a generic question and in the sense that it depends a bit on the situation to what you are obliged uh, to adhere to. And I hope this answers uh, Jack's question. Jack, I suggest also in the interest of time just to collect your question and send that as a support. I have a feeling this will be useful for the others as well beyond uh, being at yeah. the last five minutes of this uh, recording. Yeah. Uh, I would go next to a friend of ours, Silesep, that was in our team until a couple of months ah. ago. It's a very good question for everybody. So first of all, hi, Sile. Uh, she <laughs> asked, uh, regarding the legal building blocks, do you plan to also provide templates for contractual agreements? Furthermore, I appreciate the approach of triggers in the legal building blocks. So it would be great to further operationalize these I know this is challenging as it is contextual for the sector, but for some further uh, concreteness, it would be useful. Uh, yeah. What do you think, guys? Yeah, I can answer that question. Uh, well, with the toolbox, we started on the technical side, but the plan is to also have in the toolbox, uh, also for the business, legal, and organizational building blocks, uh, tools, and these relate to templates, contractual templates, and people can also submit them uh, when we have that part uh, ready. So yes, the plan is to further uh, develop that. And I shared also in chat the work done by one of our predecessor projects uh, that uh, support center for data sharing that also developed a few standard templates, for example. So it's, yeah, no, it's not indeed. good to be thrown. Yeah. Um, oh, one of the, the Elias Kick, uh, if I say it correctly, won the prize for the most difficult question today. Uh, so <laughs> I will share with you what is possible in terms of enforcement. We are using ODRL in our connectors, but here we can only say what the receiver is and is not allowed to do, but we cannot really enforce that they do that. Yes. And, and what possibilities does the governance authority have in order to give uh, fines or oh, fines uh, like uh, yeah I fine you because you did wrong if one participant does not adhere to the data transaction agreements maybe Would maybe you... I can try to answer that one uh, it's it's an excellent question and uh, we actually discussed this also internally uh, ourselves a couple of times so the thing is you are sharing data so by default the data goes to another party that does something with that data otherwise you wouldn't be sharing Right, so that's that's the, the starting point. Um, then also by default, the means to fully technically enforce what happens on the other side, by default, they are limited. I mean, there are certain technological approaches that you could take, but by default, they are limited because you are actually sharing the data. You can think of certain ways like uh, uh, doing some reverse uh, thing, like sending the algorithm to the data instead of the data to the algorithm. So there are some ways of, of doing that. But generally speaking, you share the data so it gets into the other ones. Then what you can say is say, okay, if I do with ODRL, I do a bit of contract negotiation, then at least I have some options of saying, well, uh, the other person should, or the other participant should limit the use of the data in this and that way, according to that policy. But this is when where the link comes in with the business and organizational building blocks. So um, I would assume that you are not only exchanging the ODRL policy, but that maybe you have a framework contract, either one-on-one -on -one with that participant, or even better, that it is part of the agreement that you have on the data space level. That includes a certain liability for the user of the, of the data. And probably that's then also reflected in the participant credential that was issued. So in that sense, the data space governance authority could say, this organization has signed this contract 
it will be held liable according to the terms of that uh, contract. So if there then is a breach of uh, uh, data protection, so for instance, you did share the data, you did agree to a certain uh, policy, but if then it shows up that the data was leaked or was misused, not according to the terms, then you not only have the, the technical setup, but you also have the legal contracts uh, to, to underpin it. Uh, and there are, there are then different ways of, of doing that. I, I will not can, go into all those details here today, but this is really where you should see a, a connection between on one hand, the legal options that you have, and on the other hand, the technical options to, uh, to enforce it. Uh, and by the way, I mentioned uh, observability. Um, that can also be a very important element uh, here, uh, because if this is sensitive, like for instance, this is sensitive medical data, then maybe you actually, as part of your policy, want to record that data was accessed. Uh, and then later on, you could further rely on that. Uh, thanks, Matthias. It, it's also, this reminds me also something that our colleague at the Commission, uh, Ivo Foreman, told us on this stage of European Big Data Value Forum, something like, do not expect more legislation about it. <laughs> We're done. Yeah. Right? So don't forget that there is already legislation for a lot of stuff. Uh, and, and, and the fact that you're in the data space does not stop make that applicable. Uh, Tier course in chat says, have you been working on IP? Uh, well, IP legislation exists. We may say perhaps it's not ideal or may benefit from some refreshing thinking that in this context, but for the time being, there's no perhaps not yeah, and, 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 and it's, it's not always the, the legal part rightfully as you say so so partly it's legal in the sense that uh, there are certain legal provisions like in the gdpr but even with personal data in the gdpr you still need to have your own privacy regulations and your data usage policies and all of that um so so legal doesn't solve everything you also need contracts and you need a bit of technology to uh, to support it and the three need to go hand in hand Perfect. Uh, the last one for today, probably in the time we have available, uh, Manuel Gutierrez, Diego, and uh, Ale again building on top of it. Manuel says, uh, most of the specific blueprints uh, released by the common European data spaces are inspired uh, in the DSSC blueprint. Is yeah. there a plan to follow the evolution of the deployment project so that DSSC can create a kind of recompilation of the different tangible building blocks used in those mentioned deployments. Uh, do you expect to see specific blueprints for each specific uh, economic sector? And just a little addition by Lea, uh, it's difficult being a little actor trying to set up uh, a small and simple data space uh, without having something to rely upon. I'm, I'm uh, let's say, interpolating. Uh, what, how can you help us, guys? Uh, I think a very nice example uh, uh, that was uh, earlier this week, uh, I believe there was a mission to, uh, to Asia from the manufacturing domain, from Manufacturing X. And essentially what you're doing there is that you have a few common rules, so a common rule book for the manufacturing domain um, uh, that everyone can use. And, and this is, for me personally, how, how I would see this moving forward. Uh, so that can be in the sense of a best practice, like in the case of manufacturing, it's just a best practice with German platform industry 4.0, with uh, the French counterparts and, and other actors from, from all over the world collaborating and talking about, well, uh, things for digital twins and how to share them and providing some, some common framework uh, based, uh, based on that. And in that case, it's a best practice. I think in other cases, uh, for instance, in more regulated sectors, it's simply more man mandatory uh, so that, that there will be uh, a, a rule book fully driven by legislation in a certain domain to, like to do it. Uh, yeah, like in health, I think yeah. that's, a, that's a very good example. It's a highly regulated domain. So there, there will be a mandatory rule book that everybody should adhere to. Um, uh, and then actually, uh, but maybe this is a nice topic moving forward to version uh, 2.0 of the blueprint. I could, could also see the interlinkages between those uh, things. So maybe there is something on a sectorial uh, level and then different initiatives in that sector uh, link to that or uh, uh, reuse uh, that uh, result with a more specific rulebook moving forward. Um, but for us, this is also a topic uh, towards version 2.0 uh, uh, of uh, the blueprint. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, Gianfranco, you mentioned uh, the channels, how to contact uh, us. 
if you want to engage with us on this uh, topic, uh, feel free to do so, and uh, we value your inputs on this. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to all of our guests today, uh, Rafik, Matthias, and Claire. Uh, one minute left just to say goodbye and to suggest what the next topic will be at the next Insight Series webinar. We will talk about generative AI and ah. the degree to which uh, uh, data spaces can enable what uh, sometimes are called AI factories. So let's say venues where um, uh, models for AI can be created and shared under appropriate licensing and fed by data sources in data spaces. Uh, interesting, hi. Huh? Uh, I, I promise we will not be deep fakes next time we talk. Uh, and uh, I invite you to uh, save the date uh, that I don't have with me, but I believe we also save, save a certain pattern. We will ask Anna. And thanks for your attention and time so far. That was a great opportunity with us today. See you next time.